Joining me now is author Jamie Michaels from Winnipeg and from Toronto, from Historica Canada, Ellie Yarhi. Welcome to the CJN Daily. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. So uh, we're about to mark the 88th anniversary of the Christie Pitts riots. Um, briefly, why is this such a seminal story? Start with you, Jamie. I think the Christie Pitts riots kind of really captured a time in Canada's history where it was a different Canada than we can picture it today. It was a xenophobic Canada. It was a Canada of Anglo supremacy. And the Christie Pitts riots, in my mind, marks a point where the Jewish community said, no, they stood their ground in, in a public space. They fought for a Canada that could be brighter than it was, that could be more multicultural than it was. And in the aftermath of the riot, we see Mayor Stewart introduce maybe one of Canada's first pieces of anti-hate speech legislation, a policy that banned the flying of the swastika in Toronto. And kind of from that seed, we really see a, a small push towards the multicultural Canada that we, we have today. And why did uh, Historic in Canada feel after all these years that it was time to revisit this important historical event? This was part of a larger multiculturalism education campaign that we've been launching this year. It includes a three-part mini documentary series of which this, is, this video is a part, uh, but it also includes a five-part podcast series and an education guide to follow um, this fall that will sort of encapsulate everything together and bring this material to our primary audience, which is students and their teachers. Um, when we were considering this story, we had known for some time that we wanted to cover it. And when this project came up, uh, we knew that it would be a shoe in. Um, I had purchased a graphic novel for myself and a, a second copy for my father-in-law. And when I showed up to give him the book, he also had a book ready for me. So we swapped the same book back and forth. Um, so we were you know, very excited to, to cover this at Historica Canada. Um, and especially as Jamie was pointing out, we're looking for stories that showed some agency on the part of the communities in question. Some of the other uh, uh, mini documentaries in this series uh, include also the story of the Komagata Maru in 1914, uh, and also the construction of the Al Rashid Mosque in Edmonton. So uh, we we like to identify these stories in which the um, you know, those who were oppressed at the time are demonstrating some level of protections for their community in, in, in quite vocal and impactful ways. Now, you know, a couple of years ago when your book came out, Jamie, you said, quote, we certainly don't live in the same hateful conditions of 1933, but I believe there are lessons to be gleaned from the riots that are relevant today as much as when they occurred. Fast forward to 2021, the summer of 2021, when uh, rising anti-Semitism uh, has spiked uh, in, you know, because of the uh, May hostilities between Israel and Hamas, um, you know, where does your book fit in even today, where this is, if not the worst, then close to the worst anti-Semitism the world has seen since Second World War? I think we're really learning the lessons in my graphic novel, the correlation between culture and violence. And in 1933, it may have been the connection between newspapers and between public animosity. In contemporary Canada, we're really seeing a lot of this inflammation being driven digitally on social media, online, on forums. So I think that idea of, of radicalization the idea of anti-Semitism is tied to two factors. It's tied to the media that people consume, but it, it's also tied to economic conditions. And, and it's no surprise that the Christie Pitts riots uh, was taking place at the height of the Great Depression. And in the same way now, we're seeing a lot of economic stratification. So I think the, the playbook is, is still very similar. And what I'm hoping people can glean is kind of lessons of tolerance from the graphic novel, while at the same time acknowledging that there are parallels, but no two moments in history are, are exactly analogous. I want to pick up on something you just mentioned. Um, you know, earlier in you're doing your uh, book launches, you mentioned that the swastika is the symbol and called it Tinder. We see swastikas being put uh, on cars, on schools, on Jewish cemeteries, on uh, you name it, uh, around Canada and of course around the world this year. Um, 
you know, you said the conditions are economic uh, strat. What did you say? Stratification. But we've also had a COVID problem, uh, which has made people even more unsettled uh, and and looking for answers and looking to blame someone. Um, so, you know, do you see that you know we're in a serious, serious situation like they were back eighty eight years ago today? Again, I really want to stress that these these moments in history are unique. Um, this idea that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So I don't want to say that we're living in 1933. I, I don't think that that's an appropriate direct comparison. I think that we really have to combat this anti-Semitism ferociously with, with the knowledge that the conditions are different, the behavior is different. Um, we still have to treat it with an incredible amount of gravitas. Projects like this Historic Canada documentary, the Christie Pitts graphic novel. We're working towards educating younger Canadians about the, the risks of, of this inflammatory rhetoric. Um, yes, absolutely. These, these swastikas are, are gravely concerning. But I think that now, unlike then, we're seeing condemnation from public figures. We're seeing the prime minister having this, this national summit, this forum on anti-Semitism. So th there are things about the time that we're living in now that, that give me hope. I want to ask you about the reaction uh, to your, uh, this is for the Historic Canada uh, moment that came out. Um, I want to ask you, what was the reaction in June when, uh, when this little video was released? Generally, very positive. Um, we were really proud to see that uh, there was great pickup. Um, a lot of, you know, influential folks were um, sharing the story on their in their networks, um, which actually managed to make this one of the most successful non Heritage Minute organic launches that we've had for a video project. Um, so, in, in those terms, we we saw a lot of people uh, just anecdotally describing how. Um, how important it is to to see this story covered, um, certainly at a time such as this, such as now, um, and that also that they they see themselves reflected in depictions of Canadian history, good, bad, or in, in this case, you know, terrible. So, um, I noticed when I was preparing for today's interview, uh, the comments are turned off. When I saw the uh, video released in June. Uh, there was some chatter online about hateful comments being posted on the YouTube site where it was released. Can you walk me through what happened uh, with Historic Canada uh, decision to deal with these comments and and was were there ever comments allowed and then what happened? We are of course in charge of moderating the comments on the uh, the YouTube channel mm -hmm. and other platforms as best we can. Um, we were initially, you know, able to to mitigate a lot of the negative and truly unsettling comments that were being posted to the YouTube video, and it did reach a point where, uh, rather than keeping up with the, you know, the comments that were that were landing on the page that were truly terrible, terrible, um, we decided to to end comment, commenting on the on the video. So what is that? How does that impact you personally on such an important project that you shepherded through when you see this garbage uh, and toxic comments as well? You, that is, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it hits you, right? Cuts you right to the quick, um, so to speak. Um, my father always has an expression that you're only as Jewish as somebody else wants you to be. Mm. And it's in instances like that that I think it really drives home. And... It's not something that you necessarily encounter in your day to day, um, but it's there on time from time to time. It's just very, it's a shame uh, because that's not how you were expecting this to go, right? But you, you, you launched it right after the, uh, the Hamas Israel hostilities. Um, so you weren't to know, I suppose, how this was going to work out. I, I am sort of familiar with when when Jamie launched the book that he said that the uh, you know the timing of its arrival was um, I can't remember the quote exactly but he said that it was depressingly topical and that was in 2019 um, and here we are again in 2021. So how are you both uh, using your material or planning to use your material? Uh, you talked about education uh, for young people. That's your 
your target? You know, what 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 is it being used for uh, in schools? Can you give some examples of uh, your talks and your your lectures and how it's being adopted, if at all, in schools? Both the the little video as well as your book. Sure. So the the graphic novel, uh, we've had the opportunity uh, just before COVID really took it away from us of presenting this work in, in some schools. And, you know, as a, a Jewish book with, with Jewish themes, you can't present it without a modicum of shtick. So the shtick we had and, and in the graphic novel, we covered this incredible boxing match between Hitler's favorite boxer, um, you know, Max Schmeling fighting this Jewish number one contender, Max Baer at a sold out Yankee stadium. So this is an electric moment in sports. It kind of captures the feeling of the age, the rise of Nazism, the pains of the depression. And it's really this electric moment being radio broadcast around the world. So to kind of facilitate that and to try to draw these, these young people into this world, we have two boxers planted in the crowds. And as we give the reading, the boxers come out and enact this historic match, which I feel really brings people into that moment. There's yelling, there's foot stomping, and we try to make the, the history uh, at a higher speed limit than it's usually taught. So that's been great. We've gotten great reception from the classrooms we've been in, and we're hoping to reinvigorate that process after everyone is fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So are you able to be doing it on, were you able to do it online at all over the last 18, 16 months? Um, I don't think it, it carries the same gravitas. I think there's a certain level of Zoom fatigue. So we're um, planning to, to reinstigate the process in real time. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the this being used in schools uh, in, for Historica Canada? How are you going to uh, use it this fall? We have a network of over 70,000 educators in our um, who we reach out to regularly. And so this fall, the uh, education guide that I had referenced earlier will, will land and uh, it will have specific uh, lesson lesson plans um, drafted for teachers to use to to teach this um, this mini documentary in their classrooms. And one of okay. the one of the great things about this is, of course, that it's a graphic interpret interpretation of um, something that doesn't necessarily have all of the visual elements that the story would have would would have to be necessarily told in a in a in a bright and um, impactful way right let's talk specifically about the art and and the, the the genre of graphic novels if we can um i couldn't find it online in any online version or ebook version um and that's kind of where young people gravitate uh, can you speak to the decision and i might be wrong of course but is there was there a decision just to have it as a physical novel and not anything that they can share and watch on on their phone yeah, so I think that for the graphic novel, it really lends itself to being a physical medium. It doesn't have the same impact if you're on a tablet as, let's say, a conventional book of prose. So our decision was kind of to, to respect the medium, to respect the hard copy. Uh, we did a limited digital release for people that were unable to um, have a hard copy shipped to them or wanted an advanced educator's copy. So there is a digital version, but we deliberately haven't been selling them in our online shop because our preference is always really push the hard copy experience. Hmm. A lot of my students actually watch, uh, you know, graphic novels and cartoons uh, on YouTube and web X web series and things like that. You know, um, that's what they on YouTube. So uh, right. is there any planning to do anything like that at all the, in the, the future? Video, making it animated? The video uh, and the comic medium, I feel are quite different. And for the comic medium again, and I might be a purist and maybe I'm an artist first and, and a businessman second, that very well may be the case, but uh, I, I do respect the hard copy medium for, for the graphic novel form. Uh, Christy Pitts has been optioned as an animated film. So uh, we're working with a, a Toronto studio right now. We've just finished a, a first seven minute proof of concept. So the wheels are turning on that project. So as an animated film, I, I can certainly live with it. I think I'll be delighted to, to see it take that form and reach young people that way. But for the graphic novel, I think there's a real advantage to having it in your hands. And also we incorporate so much archival material from the day into the graphic novel. We incorporate uh, you know, primary source newspaper clippings. And I want students to be able to stop and read them and not be rushed through that process. So again, I think the graphic novel gives you something, the documentary gives you something, and the animated film will give you something. 
Can we talk specifically about some of the, I don't know, for lack of a better word, Easter eggs or hidden um, uh, hints uh, or throw, uh, throwbacks to certain uh, uh, historical events or people in your book? Um, so, for example, the boxer Sami, I know about Sami Lufspring. Was that the inspiration for that name? I think the, the inspiration, my, my grandfather is also a Sami. So there's, there's some family lore uh, woven into that text, but I think, you know, I also read the, uh, the Love Spring biography, and I think that Jewish boxing was such a dominant part of Jewish culture in Toronto in the 30s, and I think people find that surprising today. And if, and if you look at different waves of uh, immigrant culture coming to North America, boxing has always been a bit of a harbor for them. So I, I kind of wanted to capture that feeling of the time, and I think the fact that it's had that tradition gives it a certain universality. What about one of the other things that people should be looking for when they're looking through the novels that's maybe more recent history of, uh, uh, let's say, in the States, for example, of uh, wh where can they find these little Easter eggs? Sure. So I, I think you're kind of giving a nod to when they had these horrific Charlottesville Tiki Torch white supremacist marches. I was so enraged by this as, as a creator, and I went back to the, the graphic novel and I wanted to edit some sections to include illustrations of these white supremacists in the graphic novel drawn as members of the Swastika Club. So I feel that if you know, you're know you openly going to embrace Nazi values, you should be uh, publicly identified as such. So this is kind of a subtle nod to immortalizing these, these groups of truly despicable people in black and white, and also kind of nodding at the, the correlation between the emotions that bring these people into these movements ac across history. What about this um, this urban legend that the lyrics to Bob Cajun are uh, referenced to it? I have some of the lyrics here. Uh, did you ever, first of all, let's, I'll read them out. And their voices rang with that Aryan twang. I got to your house this morning, just a little after nine. And the, anyway, it talks about people riding on horseback, keeping order restored to the men they couldn't hang. Is this really a thing? Did you research that? Did you ask them? Sure. I'm so tragically I, hip, I should say, just for our listeners. I suppose that uh, art and interpretation are always in the eye of the, the beholder. I, I certainly see some references in that track in our encyclopedia article for the Canadian Encyclopedia. We do reference that correlation, but I think everyone has to listen to the song and make up their own mind. But you never talk to them about it. Oh, I, and I have yet to have the opportunity to have coffee with the tragically hip, but it's certainly, you know, <laughs> it'd be on the list. Um, and about the, some things, let's do five things that people probably don't know about the, 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 the Christy Pitts riots. So the first thing is swastika clubs and the beaches of Toronto. What is that? People should know what that was. Because today, you know, the, that's the sort of shishi place to buy a house. Everybody goes to the beaches. But if you pale back, you know, 80, 80 years, 85 years, um, the swastika clubs are, are something we should tell them. Sure. So I, I would frame swastika clubs as associations of young men uh, in Toronto's beaches with the manifesto of, quote, keeping Toronto's beaches uh, clean, end quote, or, quote, keeping Toronto's beaches free of undesirables, end quote. So I think that you're looking at a group of, of xenophobic young men, and that kind of shows the, the baked in Anglo anti-Semitism of the day. And they're using a symbol that they know has cachet and symbolism um, for Toronto's Jewish community. And, and it's always hard to view these things in retrospective. Today, the swastika means a very specific thing. In, in 1933, I, I think this is maybe in addition to these five things you should know, Toronto's Jewry was amongst the best educated in the world of the atrocities being committed in Nazi Germany. The Toronto Daily Star was one of the hardest hitting newspapers of that time in history. We're looking at a Toronto Daily Star where Ernest Hemingway was a reporter. We're looking at Pierre Van Passen being a special correspondent um, overseas, being captured by the Nazis and escaping and bringing some of the most visceral, disturbing journalism to Toronto. So th there couldn't be a better informed community. I, I believe it was the first North American newspaper to be banned by Nazi Germany. So this, this information is coming to the Jewish community. So when they see the symbol, they know what it stands for. And, and the Swastika Club was deliberately anti-Semitic and inflammatory as such. So th these, you know, these organizations in which Canada has a long history of, which, which is covered in the documentary, 
um, were, in, in my imagination, perhaps best represented by these swastika clubs on the beaches. Okay, and how many people, this is another thing, how many people were ever charged uh, and convicted of the uh, of assaults during the Christie Pitts riots? That's another thing people don't know. Yeah, I think two charges were laid during the course of the riot, um, and, and both were, I think, maybe a couple nights in jail were spent, but really these, these are token charges laid by the police who, who are undergoing a major scandal for have been warned about this riot and not uh, allocating the correct amount of enforcement. And they said, you know, the Jews are in the streets and we'll let society sort it out. And I think the pushback from the Jews was unforeseen by the police department and hence the scale of the riot. And um, what I'll ask you uh, from Historica Canada's perspective, what was the one thing you didn't know that you learned, uh, Eli, about, uh, about the Christie Pitts riots? I would say definitely its connection to some of the first anti, um, anti-hate legislation in Canada. That was something that uh, was novel to me and uh, I'm sure my colleagues as well. Um, we definitely tried to expand the scope for this mini documentary to uh, contain more of a national um, historical approach. Um, and so to, to bring that initial um, let piece of legislation as it would expand out later as Canada became a bit, you know, a much more um, welcoming uh, place that uh, was definitely news to us. You, uh, I forgot to ask you, how are you, if at all, going to be marking the anniversary? Uh, we will be, you know, doing a secondary launch for the, uh, the video itself, uh, which we're very much looking forward to. Um, looking to see some additional pickup there as uh, we know that it's, it's had a great, uh, it had a great initial launch. And then of course, there's likely to be another tertiary push in the fall um, when we sort of bring the entire multiculturalism education campaign together. Um, so that's that. I'm working on a small article uh, about lessons uh, from Christy Pitts that are applicable to the time we live in now. Um, God willing, it will be finished by the anniversary. And uh, I'll be putting that out and looking forward to feedback. And telling people how they can get the second cop- second edition of, or second run of your book because it's sold out, right? Absolutely. Every copy uh, flew off the shelves, the classic Historica Canada bump. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting the second run underway and uh, hopefully in the fall going back into schools and helping to share this history. Okay. It was great to have both of you uh, here on the CJN Daily. Thanks so much. Terrific to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much.